Today we've got questions on John Locke, the American Revolution, the history of Romania, and historically great and bad decisions from popes. Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu, now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a bucolic Charles Coulomb. Bucolic? You mean I'm out of I'm out on the farm, huh? Oh yeah. Kind of away from the big city. The big city lights. Yeah, you're just chilling for the summer, you know, out on the front yeah. porch. Yeah. Iced tea in the hand. Just you know, kind of looking at looking at the crops being dragged in and just, you know. Yeah, yeah I can see that. We're kind of agricultural country around here. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, all right. Bucolic will do, yeah. Uh, Pepperidge Farms, remember? What? <laughs> what? What is that? There was an ad for Pepperidge Farms. Pe- did you say Pepperidge Farms remembers? Yeah. What what does Pepperidge Farms remember? Remembers the, the way things used to be, you know, the good old days. You know when uh, when uh, a cake was a cake and a soup was a soup. Pepperidge Farms remembers all that. Yep, <laughs> give it a try. <laughs> 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 if that was an advertising campaign, I would buy Pepperidge Farms for all their all their products. That's so good. Sure, sure was. Yep. <laughs> Pepperidge Farms remembers. Is that from like the twenties? Like what? What? What date range is that advertising from? Oh Lord, the seventies or eighties? Oh, seventies or eighties. Yeah, I mean, it gives you the impression wow. that the guy who's doing it. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on, Pepperidge Farms remembers. They're uh, now see they you know, today they just make I think cookies and so on. They're now owned by Campbell's. Yeah, but um, and they used to make soup, canned soup that was really out of this world. They don't make the soup anymore, sadly, but they make cookies, crackers, bread, etc. Pepperidge Farm. Remembers. Marshall. Yeah. Oh, there it is. There it is. I'll, uh, yeah, 1979. Hold on just a minute. Okay, hold on. Let me, let me get this to you. And I, this will help. This will definitely, definitely help. I don't know if you can play it for the audience, but. I can't do that, Charles. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, well, definitely copyright. I can't do that, but um, yeah, definitely on YouTube. Okay, it's right there. Uh, it's okay. So that old man. That, that's kind of like a. It's kind of like a Colonel Sanders feel, almost. A little bit, you know? yeah. Kind of the the old old timer, you know. Yeah. You know, you can edit it here right now, and go ahead and play it. So just a few seconds. I'm not going to do it, Charles. No, go ahead. Go ahead and watch. It's just a few seconds. Okay. All right. Fine. A reaction video of everyone watching my face as I watch this. That absolutely would not play today. That there, there's, there's. 
it wouldn't play. Why not? It, it just wouldn't. It wouldn't. We would people have trouble with the gizmo or, or the kid's haircut? We. <laughs> You know, it doesn't play because the. I feel like we're so immersed in the logical fallacy and the political logical fallacy that the future is always better than the past. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like, like. I I do, but you know the problem with that? What? The popularity of Mad Men. Right, right. I it, well, it's funny because. Season one, you can see it's actually kind of a hit piece almost on it, but but it changed, it, oh. and it changed because the audience liked. Yeah. Well, there was supposed to be. It was so awful back then. Ooh, turned into our audience. Uh, they liked that, and uh, and we we want to keep in production and keep making money. So, uh, uh, uh. well, you know, it, it showed some interesting things. I remember um, season two or season three. There, one of my favorite scenes that I really liked um, was um, involved Don Draper. A very simple scene where so Don Draper is a lech, right? Like he he sleeps yeah. around. He's he's a womanizer. Okay, he's he's amoral in my opinion on on, on various issues, right? He's on very, everything, not just not just chicks. Everything. Everything. Okay. Um, Almost uh, everything. So, um, but so he goes into the elevator, and there is an old lady there, and these two people, these two young, um, kind of um, ill-mannered people, uh, men, are discussing sort of salacious details of, um, you know, girls, and it's rude to say the least. And Don Draper was like visibly uncomfortable, and he sort of says he 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 verbally accosts them and says, "Take your hat off. Take your hat off," you know. And then he literally grabs his hat and he takes it off because there's a woman in the elevator, and that's what you do. That's correct. When there's a woman in the elevator, and that was his way of silencing them out of respect in this public scenario for the woman. So. That I thought of you during that too, because I felt like that was an example of even uh, morally challenged people. Like seriously, <laughs> I like that. Point. Seriously, no, seriously, morally challenged. Like yeah, like he's he's got serious problems, but even he knows. And like, there's a certain line there that he's like, "No, you you don't do that here, right?" And we've lost. I, I don't know how to describe that well, but well, we've lost the sense of etiquette, right? Etiquette, I mean, etiquette. Uh, we we uh, there was a very funny night gallery years ago, where these people got on the elevator, and one of them is this weird creature with a skull instead of a face, yeah, and it's got its hat on, and there's a lady there, and, and the name of the thing was an act of chivalry. And so the guy next to the skull face taps him on the shoulder and points to the lady. So he takes his whole head off. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Right. <laughs> but this goes back to a point you've made um, a long time ago on the show. So long ago, it was like the first in the first hundred episodes, I think it was about the British or something uh, in longstanding traditions and how a tradition dies and how etiquette dies. You have to look what's actually underneath the thing itself. What no. spawns the tradition and, and the respect toward women in is bound up in chivalry, which is bound up in love in, in devotion to Mary. Yeah, ultimately. So, so ultimately, so when you lose these things, then I mean, sometimes the tradition dies, right? Like people don't even know why they're doing this, in a sense. But eventually, that fades as that fades, and then you don't have anything. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's face it. The reason why 
no one takes their hat off uh, to ladies or rises when a woman enters the room or holds the door or anything like that. It's because we don't really care about chicks anymore. They act like men, men like act like women, you know, and we're run by morons who have no gender of their own anyway and wouldn't know what one was if it was stamped on them like a cookie cutter. Not that that's a bad thing. I would never criticize my masters. Okay. What? My owners deserve all the respect they deserve and not one bit less. Okay, that's that's a very well-formed uh, sentence, okay. They deserve all the respect they deserve. Got it? They Got do. It. Every huge chunk of it tossed at them real hard. Onto the steaming pile of perfection, yes. That's right, the steaming pile <laughs> of perfection. That's right. Let them let them wallow in a in a in a, in a pit of probity. <laughs> let them let them reek of perfection. Let the stench of their goodness rise to the heavens. Wow, we've we've really um, gotten away from the non-judgmental thing, haven't we? Uh, who's stuff? judging? I'm praising right now. <laughs> is that what it is? Of course it's what it is. My masters are every bit as intelligent as you'd expect from their works. <laughs> and their works are wonderful, aren't they? Okay. I don't know where to take this conversation from here, Charles. Just so just just go some random direction, please. Really? Yeah. How random? Pretty random. Bunnies. Okay, don't no, never mind. Okay. All right. No, no, uh, you, you said <laughs> I, I'm just doing what I was told. You said random. <laughs> I'm going random. Buddies. Okay, never mind. I was. Have you ever I, owned a buddy? Have you ever I, owned a buddy? I had a, a moment, a momentary. Uh, have, my, my, my brain have you, wasn't you, working. You, for have you ever owned a buddy? No. So you feel the buddies are enslaved. I. Wow. Okay. So I see how you got there. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that was your 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 owning a buddy would be eth- would be ethically immoral for you. No, I just I just don't have the money, you know. I there there's just no bunny merchants nearby. I see. So cheap buddies you have no interest in. I get it. How do you feel about flying buddies? Non-existent. I, I'm I'm a skeptic when it comes to flying bunnies. Oh, I see. So basically, there's no room in your worldview for flying buddies. Yes. You're, you're, you close <laughs> yourself off to the possibilities. I have closed myself off, yes. Well, so, okay. So basically, when it comes to buddies, you're emotionally unavailable. Is there some term for what you're doing? Because it's so <laughs> pointed. <laughs> pointed pointed yes it's called mental exploration i'm helping you decide where you stand in the whole bunny universe do you know there's actually a bunny museum in pasadena and i'll bet you've never even been there have you no i didn't think so you have no interest in it <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> well, I've never been there either. And I guess in your in your place, I would have said, "Have you ever been there?" But see, you did. You were taking the attacks. You see, it was this hammering away at insane nonsense, and and you didn't you didn't push back. Who died and made you the bunny chieftain? Huh? <laughs> you know that kind of thing. You could have said. I what is know. this weird obsession you've got with bunnies? There we go. That's definitely true. I that's definitely a missed opportunity that I regret. Uh, going all the way, th- and that goes all the way back to Harvey, where bunnies oh, are taking oh, oh, oh. humanoid form and being creepy. So now we're abusing poor Harvey. 
uh, why poor Harvey? You don't you don't know anything about Harvey. Maybe he's. I do know about Harvey. I know he's loyal. I know he's six feet tall, which is a little little large for a buddy, I guess. I know that he's invisible to anyone he doesn't really like. And those he does like, he must have been warming up to uh, what's his name, sister, because she was starting to see him. And he and he liked the head of the asylum. All right, all right. Um, now, now, now let me ask you, let me ask you, if you had a choice, okay, death is not an option. You have a choice. A Harvey marathon. So you see an endless loop of the same film over and over for, say, a day. A Harvey marathon or a Barbie marathon? Barbie marathon? Like the movie? Yeah. Death is not an option. Harvey or Barbie? Your call. Okay. Oh, man. Oh man! <laughs> hey, it's only eighteen hours, but it's eighteen hours you'll never get back. Harvey or Barbie? I guess Harvey. I mean, I guess I can. You made the right choice. Believe me, an invisible six-foot puka hanging around your house is better than a bunch of Barbie dolls. Your wife might not notice the the uh, the invisible bunny. I guarantee you, she would notice the dolls and really begin to wonder. I, okay. Okay. Are you okay? I, I I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, and, and by the way, by the way, before you go any further, I've got a bone to pick with you. What? Well, I was talking to Dan Devine of all people or actually uh, emailing back and forth. And, you know, I, I made a number of comments and you know what his response was? What? Now I see how Vinny feels. Uh, they... Now see the implication there. The implication is that you're being put through some sort of torture. The truth is that both you and Dan are being helped in a way that only a life coach can really help someone. With help like yours, who needs torture? Well, you know, torture can be a kind of help <sighs> if it's aimed in the right direction. Toward buddies, for instance. But I must say you chose wisely. Harvey over Barbie. That was a, that was a very smart choice, and to to show you to reward you for that choice, I promise you that today and tomorrow your home will not be visited by a six foot tall invisible puka. Okay, great. <sighs> so you want any dolls, either? Yeah, you want to no okay. dolls, either? Okay, okay. What would you say to a doll? tied to a brick thrown through your window in typical uh, Tumblr house fashion. Thrown through my window? Anybody's window. But your window, sure. <sighs> a Barbie doll tied to a brick. And... I would say... Oh, one second, Charles. Pause for station identification. <laughs> Up the menu is now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadejournal.com. My church, great guy. Support uh, the Crusade Channel uh, endeavors. Subscribe to them. A lot of quality content on that station. A lot of quality content. All I, right, I, sorry. That was, that, was, that was a wonderful maneuver. Uh, you, you, have, you have my complete approbation for pulling that. All right, where were we? Moving the show along. Um, I Something think next about buddies thing is book bricks. of the week. No, <laughs> book of the week. Oh, book of the week. Well, I'm afraid it's not one that you've got, although if you could get a hold of it, I don't think it's in print. Okay. But it is the best book on the French Revolution I have ever read. 
Wow. Okay. By a man called Bernard. Looks like Bernard. Fay. F A Y Umau. Bernard Fay. It's called Louis XVI or the End of a World. And it really, really puts Louis XVI. Uh, well, first, it'll reveal a lot about him that most people don't know. Uh, you know, it, it, it came out in 1967, actually, so it's quite old. But um, it deals with him from a very sympathetic point of view and points out the many, 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 many good things he did. Uh, in terms of the, the reforms in France and, and his personal life, his religious life. Uh, and really, what an all-around great character Louis XVI was. Um, and how, how, as is so common with great characters, I mean, there's, there's a, a string running through the lives of certain monarchs in history, from Charles I of England to Karl I of Austria-Hungary. Um, the better they are, the worse they get betrayed. <laughs> so Louis XVI certainly falls into that category. Uh, and there are a number of, of villains in his story, but probably the worst was the Duke of Orléans, his cousin, who actually voted for his death. He, he joined the revolution, renamed himself Philippe Egalité, uh, voted for his cousin the king's death at the so-called trial, and then got to be executed himself during the height of the terror. So he paid the price for his garbage with his own life, which was, you know, good. Uh, just anyway. But Louis XVI or the end of a world, Ben Arfe. All right. Yeah, that's a very, uh, I'm trying to find how to get this book. Um, it's on Amazon, but. The hardcover is one hundred and sixty dollars, so that means it's it's kind of there's this other one hardcover is twenty seven dollars on Amazon, so it looks like that's how you guys can get it. Um, but it's by used, so it's it's out of print, and we're just kind of going through the the used copies. I guess. Oh, it's long, 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 long out of print. Yeah. Uh, but the um. Very long out of print. Yeah, I see the hardcover uh, for 16013. I think we'll skip that one. Yeah. But uh, nine U's, 3175, 35, 36, 63, 146. Woohoo. Yeah. So, yeah. So get them while they're left. Uh, all right. Uh, time for memes of the. Of production. Nationalize the memes of production. For the common good. All right, we have uh, one from uh, Too Young to Be a Curmudgeon, super fan. Uh, and that is, oh, Charles being non judgmental and Vincent, who knew exactly what to say. You're getting, you're paying me back today, I'll tell you that. Uh, for Oh, paying you, but do you hear yourself? You know, this, we, ours is not an adversarial relationship. I'm here to help. You see, the problem in life is that so often we create in our mind enmities and conflicts that don't really exist. We make things problematic when they don't need to be. And I think there's a sense in which all of us, regardless of who we are, where we're from, what our aspirations are, all of us in some sense, are yearning for the same, the same desire to, to understand, to accept, to be. And I think that that's part of the authenticity of being a human being, in some sense or another. Mm. You know, your your words right now remind me of a really good book that I started and I, I want to finish. It's oh. called "Abuse of Language, Abuse of Power" <laughs> by Joseph <laughs> Pieper. <laughs> <laughs> it's that's this is this is basically what you're doing. <laughs> this is that's hurtful. 
it's a pretty famous book actually um that has been what recommended to me from se- by several people i think it'll it'll help me yeah. sort of unmask what's going on here with charles his uh <sighs> some of his language that he's using and how he's using it to um impose help, you know, help, help. slash impose <laughs> um slash abuse abuse let me tell you something pal you couldn't get this kind of help from est I don't even know what you just said. Est, the uh, Earhart seminar, seminar training. I was really supposed to know offhand what Est is? Anybody from the 70s would have known <laughs> exactly what I was saying. The Earhart seminar training, there were these seminars. This guy, I think it was, was it Werner Earhart or something? Whatever his name was, he would basically have these weekends at hotels where he'd jump up and down and tell people how rotten they were. And they'd pay big bucks, you know, like $900 a weekend to have this guy uh, tell them all they were. It was, it was supposedly very big intellectually and so forth and psychologically. It was, again, it was the 70s, the 60s, mistakes were made. Uh, and the funny thing was, in uh, on Venice Beach, in those days, there was a comedian who was kind of a interesting person who called himself Swami X. And one of his lines was, uh, "You know, uh, uh, Earhart will take you to a hotel for a weekend for nine hundred bucks. He'll tell you what a moron you are over and over and over again." You come to my place, I'll do the same thing for 25 bucks in food stamps. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the Swami was quite right. He could he could offer the same uh, the same garbage, but much, much more cheaply. Hmm. And how much you want to bet far more people paid for the expensive brand? That's weird. That seems counterintuitive. I mean, so what was, can you even like explain that? So it's making you tougher or something to take that kind of abuse? You're you're supposed to be less insecure? You know, I I really don't know what they would try to accomplish, uh, but that's a good question. Let's see. Let's see what our friends at Wikipedia, Source of All Truth, have to say. Uh, Not Eastern Standard Time, silly persons. Ah. Earhart Seminar Training. Yeah, there we go. Earhart Seminar is Training. Werner Earhart. See? I wasn't completely out of my mind. Now, here we go. Earhart Seminar is Training, marketed as EST, uh, was an organization founded by Werner Earhart in 1971 that offered a two weekend, six days, 60 hour course known officially as the EST Standard Training. The purpose of the training is to help one to recognize that the situations which seem to be holding them back in life are working themselves out within the process of life itself. The seminar aimed to transform one's ability to experience living so that the situations one had been trying to change or had been putting up with clear up just in the process of life itself. An S website claims that the training brought to the forefront the ideas of transformation, personal responsibility, accountability, and possibility. EST seminars operated from late 1971 to late 1984 and spawned a number of books from 1976 to 2011. EST has been featured in a number of films and television shows, including the critically acclaimed spy series, The Americans, broadcast from 2013 to 2018. Est represented an outgrowth of the human potential movement of the 1960s through to the 1970s. As Est grew, oh, you know what? I'm almost ashamed to read this. I'm almost ashamed. But as Est grew, so did criticism of it. Okay. I feel so bad now. In 1977, the film Semi Tough, which parodied the then popular course, was released. Various critics accused uh, Est of mind control or forming an authoritarian army. 
sublabeled it a cult. The last EST training took place in December 1984 in San Francisco. The seminars uh, gave way to a, a gentler course offered by Verna Earhart and Associates and dubbed The Forum, which began in January 1985. Oh, yeah, that's true. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't go to the bathroom. I forgot about that. Why? Participants. Why? Because you, you'd stop concentrating. Participants agreed to follow the ground rules, which include not wearing watches, not speaking to a called upon, not talking to their neighbors, and not le uh, eating or leaving their seats to go to the bathroom, except during breaks, separated by many hours. What a load of, I mean, sorry, what a, what a wonderful way to help people help themselves. See, that's what your generation lacks, is access to this kind of self-improvement. Uh, yeah, this one guy on, or person says, I consider the training to be a brilliant conceived Zen koan, effectively, effectively tricking the mind into seeing itself, and in thus seeing, to be simultaneously aware of who was doing the seeing, a transcend a transcendent level of consciousness, a place spacious and undefined, distinct from the tired old story that our minds continuously tell us about who we are and with which we ordinarily identify. Wow. See, there, there you go. In, in that deep, as your brother would say. Definitely. One of my, one of my favorite uh, lines for that era was the uh, the old Zen koan. To the uninitiated, a wall is just a wall. To the initiate, a wall is more than a wall. To the adept, a wall is just a wall. <laughs> okay, so does that mean... I don't get it. I mean, th to me, I interpret that as meaning. So that's because you're not like the enlightened. If you were, you would see that it means something really deep or something. Uh, I, I thought you just said the adepts see that the, a wall is just a wall. I thought that that almost meant that you're in on the scam. There's a sense in which you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> You're in on the scam. <laughs> I, that's how I interpreted it to be. Like, well, I, 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 you pull back the curtain, and it's just back. yeah, it's just a scam. The wall's just a wall, but these people think it's a lot more, and they'll pay us a lot of money for that. Gosh. You know, I really missed my calling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as the, the, the great theologian P.T. Barnum put it, there's a seeker born every minute. Uh, that's sucker. <laughs> you, <laughs> you have your sponsor, I have mine. Okay. Seeker. <laughs> no, there's a seeker born every minute. You never heard that? No, I never heard that version, no. No? <laughs> you ever hear of brain breathing, the secret of the Aztecs? Just <laughs> 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 uh, Brain breathing, the secret of the Aztecs. You never heard of that? I never heard of that. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. What are they teaching them in these schools? You've never heard of brain breathing. Gosh. I have been remiss. Well, <laughs> the quote from a novel actually called The uh, Day of the Locust. But this fellow in 1920s Hollywood uh, goes through uh, goes through a number of different religions in, in Hollywood at the time. And it, it, it really hasn't changed very much. Uh, as I say, it's from Day of the Locust. Maybe I can find the quote, the exact quote, which is fun. Uh, ah. 
I love this. The, uh, Yeah, the uh, he uh, the protagonist examines different uh, the uh, the protagonist examines different religions in LA, and uh, he uh, amongst the ones he joins are. Uh, The Tabernacle of the Third Coming, where a woman in male clothing preached the crusade against salt. And the Temple Modern, under whose glass the chromium roof, brain breathing, the secret of the Aztecs, was taught. <laughs> <laughs> so that little tiny line stuck with you. Always. Well, you got to bear in mind, you know, years ago, I, I wrote for the New Oxford Review, I wrote a, uh, a, a uh, an article called No Sane City, in which I, uh, it was kind of a look at the, the cults of L.A. when I was a kid. Yeah. And they had a lot of them. But then I go on to show that uh, it's an old heritage in the L.A. area. See, in the history of the United States, originally Puritan New England was the spotting ground of weird religions. And then after the Civil War, it shifted for just a few decades to the Midwest. And then about the 1880s, uh, 1890s, it came down to SoCal and it's been there ever since. And uh, you know, Mencken actually made the comment, the reason why there's so many strange religions in Southern California is because as he put it, there are more morons there than anywhere else. Yeah, I, I was um I was reading Marlon Brando's biography, and I guess um when he was young, it uh his parents were into spiritism, or at least his mom was, I guess. Um, spiritualism, so, yeah. Spiritualism, yeah. and that was a big thing, uh, at the turn of the century and a little bit after. Yeah. Yep. So, sure. Well, I mean, all through the Victorian era, and yeah. you had a number of, I mean, what's his face, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the uh, author of Sherlock Holmes was a big spiritualist uh, apostle. Mm. He rejected the Catholic faith uh, very strongly, became a rationalist, and then became a spiritualist. That's really weird. That, that jump doesn't seem to... It doesn't seem to be like a, a natural progression. I mean, obviously, how do you go from Catholic to rationalist then back to spiritist? Well, I mean, it was Chesterton who put it uh, very well. He said, when someone gives up f faith, it isn't that they'll believe in nothing, it's that they'll believe in anything. Wow, that's very true. I remember that quote. That's right. Yeah, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who he knew, was his contemporary, uh, is a living proof of that. He might, he, might, he might even have been on his mind when he coined the phrase. Hmm. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, we are at the 40 minute mark, so we better, Let's we better move, along. move on. Move along. Nothing to see here. Move along now. You've all got homes to go to. That's right. Uh, okay. So we're going to start with a pretty long, um, pretty long uh, comment from a patron named Love Muffin Knight. Um, so he's going to. That's a name for you. That's right. Yeah. So he's going to say a lot, a lot of nice words, and then um, he's going to finish with a question. So let's. Okay. I'll, I'll be reading uh, what he has to say here. Dear Vinny and Charles, I do not have a question today. I simply wish to share my appreciation for the existence of this podcast by sharing my story. I have been watching Off the Menu since early 2021. At the time, I had converted from agnosticism to Protestant fundamentalism at the end of November 2020, but I was not attending any church at the time because COVID had shut everything down. One of your segments popped up in my YouTube feed, and I liked it quite a bit, though honestly I have no idea why I was being recommended a Catholic monarchist podcast as a Protestant. I had watched some Bishop Barron out of curiosity, but I was never particularly convinced about the Catholic Church. 
However, I found myself watching all of your clips and tuning in every Monday for Off the Menu. After a while, I was listening to you two about as much as the Protestants. That was a problem for me, of course. So I simply prayed about what to do as I continued watching the weekly podcasts, and I started to desire the Eucharist. That was another problem for me. It definitely did not help that the Catholic churches in my area were open and the Protestant churches were live stream only. I did some reading into Marian apparitions, particularly Our Lady of Good Success, and immediately purchased my first rosary beads. This was just before Easter 2021, and I was confirmed October 31st, 2021. Though I originally went to the Novus Ordo despite effectively being a traditionalist, after a major move, I started attending an Anglican Ordinary Church every Sunday because Charles would not stop waxing poetic over it. I have since met my devout fi uh, Catholic fiancé, who affectionately called you, quote, extra from the Sopranos, and, quote, European Wonder Bread. <laughs> I think you can guess who's who. Uh, and we are planning to have an ordinariate wedding in spring 2024. I know I have not said anything in particular about some major aha moment regarding off the menu. Instead, this podcast naturalized my brain to the Catholic way of thinking without my noticing. I will forever be grateful for you and the work that you do. I know you may say that it that if it was not off the menu that hooked me in, it would have been someone or something else. But I'm happy that it was you and not someone else anyways. God bless uh, the Love Muffin Night. Well, thanks very much. And congratulations on your forthcoming nuptials. Absolutely. Now, I, I just thought I'd read the story because... I love conversion stories, regardless of you know if it's if it's for us or for someone else, because it gives me hope. You know, it, it gives me hope. Uh, Charles and I, you know, we have a lot of non-Catholic friends who we love and worry about, to be honest. Um, and so this, like, these stories reinforce that. Keep going at it, man. Just keep doing your thing, you know? Yeah. And, you know, this person eventually may act on the grace of God and, and you know, get, get accepted into the Catholic Church, you know? So and that, that, you know, whether you go Trad or Novo Sordo or Ordinariate or Eastern Rite, whatever. Get into the church. Get into the sacraments. Receive our Lord. Be baptized. Get your sins resolved. Uh, you know, honestly, without the sacraments, I cannot imagine what life is like. I didn't go through COVID. You can. You know what it was like. Uh, I, I imagine and I know. And that, that actually helps me be more charitable to other people, too, because it's like they have to carry it, right? Like, they have to live in that. Um, and you see post-COVID, too. So many people are nervous. They're, they're just mental illness is up. Um, there's a lot going on. I, I'm reading um, Father Ripperger's um, Introduction to the Science of Mental Health. He's got a PhD in that, actually. And there's a correlation between sort of belief and and philosophy and, and mental health. You know, he talks about this. Well, you know, that's true, because the more, obviously, the more you see things as they are, the saner you are. Yeah. And the less, the less. Uh, you know, and as we've said this before, if your belief is, if, if you just believe, if you're an atheist that believes that chaos, like there's no purpose to your life, there's no meaning in that you can be killed at any second and there's just a lot of bad happenings. Yeah, that's your, your mental health is going to be pretty bad, right? Like that's, you, uh, the key to mental health is a good philosophy and the, the key to a good philosophy is a good religion, in my opinion. I agree. You know? I agree. So... But thanks very much for that uh, that uh, witness. I much appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Uh, but he has a PS. He says, I don't have a question for myself, but my fiance absolutely adores Catherine the Great of Russia. 
She is her favorite world leader from all history. May Charles please share any thoughts uh, he may have about Catherine the Great and any lessons from her reign that may be useful for a young lady in this modern world like my fiance. Well, avoid her moral life. Don't be like Catherine the Great. Uh, she had her husband murdered and took many lovers. So don't do that. It's not a good, not a good role model for morals. That having been said, uh, she did do one interesting thing. Uh, she had a, a like-minded, quote unquote, uh, uh, enlightened despot next door in Prussia. She was Catherine the Second, called the Great. He was Frederick the Second, called the Great. Neither of them were real believers. So also you don't want to uh, emulate her religious views. But when the Jesuits were suppressed, uh, both Frederick and Catherine had acquired a great deal of Polish and Lithuanian real estate from the three partitions of Poland, the two partitions at that point. Actually, no, it was just one partition at that point. Anyway, they both had a lot of Polish territory. And that Polish territory had a lot of Jesuit schools in them. And so when the order came from Rome to suppress the Jesuits, neither Frederick nor Catherine were keen on doing that because they saw their value as educational institutions. So they refused to publish the bull of suppression of their respective empires, well, kingdom and empire. So the Jesuits in Russia and the Jesuits in Prussia, under the patronage of their Orthodox uh, empress and their uh, Lutheran king, nominally Lutheran king, uh, just kept going. And as a result, when the Jesuits were reestablished in 1817, because those two provinces had continued and existed continuously, that is where the Jesuits got their continuity with the pre-suppression order. Hmm. So if you're a big Jesuit fan, you can be grateful to Catherine and Frederick. So why is she called the Great? What's her legacy? Well, she conquered the Turks in, the, in southern Russia, took over Crimea and all that. The Ukrainians don't like her much, but she did drive the Turks out. Uh, and she initiated the partition of Poland, so the Poles and Lithuanians don't particularly care for her either. But uh, she modernized Russia to a great degree, introduced a lot of what was then modern stuff in the 18th century. So that's why. Okay. Uh... Okay, Michael has a great question. Uh, he says, my question for Charles is, what impact did the philosophy of John Locke have on the American and French revolutionaries, and how does this differ from what Christendom promoted for government and society? Well, the answer for the American is huge. The French was indirect through the American. Uh, John Locke's philosophy was basically invented by John Locke, strangely enough, to justify the overthrow of James II in 1688. And that's why uh, the declaration of right or whatever it was against James II, uh, it was pretty much written by John Locke, resembles the attacks on George III so closely in the Declaration of Independence. And in fact, except for the fact that Jefferson is a much better writer than Locke, if the Declaration of Independence had been a, uh, an academic paper rather than a Declaration of Independence, Jefferson would have been dinged on plagiarism because the arguments are so close. And the idea is that uh, you have this social contract and people bound together to avoid the state of nature and all that. Every religion except Catholicism is okay, which obviously doesn't what, fly very... What's up? Can, can you map that out a little bit? Where does it say that? Or where does it imply that? Oh, I'd have to pull up uh, his work. Okay. But basically, remember, he's talking about England. Right. And 
the there were many different religious sects in England, but the only one of them that was allied to potential enemies of England was Catholicism. France and Spain both being Catholic. But also he didn't really like revealed religion all that much. And dogma. Jefferson. Because, uh, no, uh, Locke. Oh, Locke. Well, Jefferson didn't like it either. But in Locke's case, it was because of the civil wars between the Puritans and the Anglicans and the fifth monarchy man of the levelers and the diggers and people like that. Um, so he was very much against intra-Protestant religious combat. Okay. And it was, so that was his shtick. Uh, what did the revolution owe to him? Everything. The American Revolution. The French Revolution uh, took Locke as mediated through the American and disestablishing the Catholic faith and replacing it with the religion of reason could be seen ultimately as a gift from John Locke, but very distorted. It's interesting. This is, you know, there. I feel like there's. This is almost like the Protestant rev, like the American Revolution. Almost is like the Protestant uh, Revolution, in a sense, because it's like, it's guided by principles on one level. I mean, th there are principles there, but at the same time, what are the economic benefits too? Right, because you make this point in Puritan's Empire about um, uh, the benefits. Because I think you said the American economy was largely uh, there was a lot of smuggling involved, yeah. um, and the problem with taxation is it, you know, it hampered that the profits a lot, and so you know that was a big incentive. I think you well, applied that, that in Puritan's Empire. It was an incentive in New England. In the South, it was also an incentive. Uh, the incentive was this. A lot of the southern planters were in debt to uh, British companies. And the revolution allowed them to disavow that debt. Right. See, so, you know, when we're talking about, oh, Locke inspired this, like, like how much is Locke and how much is just... I guess well, it has to I be mean, both, right? I, I guess... It, yeah, because self-interest... Pure self-interest. Uh, few people, even 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 if it's their own, few people can face themselves acting purely out of self-interest. They've got right. to have some sort of justification. And Locke provided it for 1688, for 1776, and to a degree for 1789. Okay. And the claim basically was that the king had violated the social contract. And that wasn't true in 1688, and it wasn't true in 1775, and it wasn't true in 1789. If anyone had violated the social contract, it was the revolutionaries in each case, if there was a social contract to violate. But instead of a contract, there was the question of duty and loyalty on the one hand and obligation on the other. Yeah. I always kind of like look for these things in society for example like um with plus with um transgenderism right transgender and operation stuff um Oof. so there's like this principle that pe that liberals have but underneath it all there's a lot of money involved too there's a lot of plastic surgery there's a lot of treatments there's a lot of hormone stuff there's so much money underneath that and, and money to be had so it's Big like pharma Big. I mean, just it, it, it's enormous. And so it's funny how when it becomes more economical, then suddenly the values change, too. And then you've got more traction. So really, it's almost like a chicken or the egg, kind of, I guess. Yeah, um, but... yeah you, you, you could definitely sense a chicken and egg thing. And I mean, let's face it, COVID made a lot of money for a lot of people. Well, of course, of course. So, exactly. Okay. Uh, so, kind of continuing this, uh, Dylan asks, uh, was the Revolutionary War a just war according to the principles of Jus ad bellum? Jus ad bellum. The answer is no. 
Why do I say this? Well, you've got to have several things. Firstly, um, is the uh, is the governmental action a danger to the faith? No. The very governmental actions that were um, cited, some of them, like the Quebec Act, were precisely attacked because they were defending the Catholic faith. Secondly, um, would the uh, would the results of doing nothing be worse than taking up arms? Definitely not. Definitely not. There, all that would have happened would have been that the British Constitution was reformed, and the grip of the oligarchy, both in the colonies and in Britain, would have been weakened. Which I guess is a terrible outcome if you're part of the oligarchy, but if you're not, it's not. And then thirdly, is there a reasonable chance of success? And the answer is no. There wasn't when they began. Um, it took uh, basically treason on the part of uh, General Howe and French and Spanish intervention to make it happen. But neither of those were on the uh, on the table when they uh, started the war. Hmm. Wow. All right. Uh, Ryan says, could Charles tell us about the social, political, and religious history of Romania in the 19th and 20th centuries? I sure could. At the beginning of the 19th century, Romania was actually two little principalities, Moldavia and Wallachia, uh, north of the Danube, under Turkish suzerainty. Each of these principalities had a different prince. Uh, the dominant religion is Romanian Orthodoxy. And of course, Romanian is a Romance language, like Latin or Italian, or I mean, it comes from Latin, it's like Italian or French or whatever. In fact, in, uh, you know how you say good evening in uh, Romanian? How? Buna sera. <laughs> wow. So, and if you ever go there, I mean, they are such a Latin people. You know, there's no no doubt. So, the Romanians, um, in 1867, I think, uh, Wallachia and Moldavia were united under one prince. Uh, in 1878, uh, Romania was made an independent kingdom under a Hohenzollern, a member of the Catholic branch of uh, the Prussian Hohenzollerns, although actually it's the, the Swabian Hohenzollerns. They're cousins, but they're separate. And these are Catholic. Hohenzollern is and uh, his name was Ferdinand I. And he uh, became king of what was... Wallachia and Moldavia united uh, with the seacoast to Bruja. Now, at this point, there were a lot of Romanians outside Romania. In Russia, the province was called Bessarabia. In Austria, Hungary, in Bukovina, in Transylvania, and in the Banat. Uh, there were a lot of Romanians. Of course, there were also mixed in with them, Hungarians and Magyars and all sorts of other minorities. So, um, I said Ferdinand, it was Carol, King Carol I of, uh, now, King Carol was pro-Austrian, and he, uh, he did patronize the, the, um, Orthodox Church. He died in 1914 and was replaced by his nephew, Ferdinand I, who was married to an English princess, Queen Marie. And they stayed neutral until 1916, when they joined the war on the side of the Allies and they attacked Austria-Hungary. But they were defeated, and most of the country was occupied, and the king had to flee to a town called Yazi. So they, um, when Russia surrendered in 1918 to the Germans. Uh, Romania had to sign a separate treaty. 
Oddly enough, it didn't lose that much land. Uh, they, the mountain passes and the Carpathians went to Austria. But Bessarabia, uh, the, the Austrians and Germans handed over to the Romanians. So they ended up with more territory than they had had. Uh, when the war was over, however, they uh, seized Transylvania and the eastern Banat. And they had Bessarabia, the Russian province, already. So this was Greater Romania. And the king was Carol's nephew, Ferdinand I. Carol had died, as I say, in 1914. Um, Romania absorbed Transylvania and Bukovina from Austria-Hungary, and with it, a lot of Austrians and a lot of uh, Magyars and so on. The same for the eastern Banat that they took. But uh, Romania was a big country at that time, very proud of itself. Uh, King Ferdinand died in the 30s. Now his wife, Queen uh, uh, Marie, she tra uh, uh, yeah, uh, Marie, she traveled all over Europe and all over America in the 20s, became very popular in the U.S., which led to Dorothy Parker, the great American writer, composing a poem in her honor that went, Oh, love is a glorious garden of song, a medley of extemporanea, and love is a thing that can never go wrong, and I am Marie of Romania. So, uh, unfortunately, however, uh, Ferdinand, uh, after the war, you have this big union of the different Romanian provinces in Alba Iulia, and you have the Kingdom of Greater Romania, he has a son, King Carol. He dies. Carol II becomes king. Uh, he sends his wife into exile and takes up publicly with his mistress, Magda Lupescu. And she keeps, uh, he keeps his, his son, King Michael, close by. So, uh, Michael or Carol had been disinherited by his father because of his private life. Michael had succeeded his grandfather, but Carol back to coup and became the ruling king again, or for the first time in 1930-something. Uh, Romania, during the Depression, became increasingly difficult. You had the rise of what is a surprisingly popular authoritarian movement called the Iron Guard. I say surprisingly popular amongst non-Romanians. Uh, and the country became ever and ever more chaotic, more and more pressure on King Carol. But the coup de grace came in 1940 after France fell to uh, Germany. France's allies in the east were left open to German attack. And Romania, rather than being attacked, joined the Axis. Carol was forced to leave, and Michael became king. In, and there he sat until 1944. The Germans are collapsing. He arrests the pro-German premier, Antonescu, and joins the Allies. The Reds occupy the country, but because Michael's prestige is such, they can't really do anything until 1947 when they force him to abdicate and leave the country. Romania stays communist. Uh, they get a uh, dictator of their own named Trochescu, who... Outwardly, is independent somewhat of the Soviet bloc. He seems very reasonable, but he's one of the most horrible, horrible dictators. He does all sorts of terrible things. In 1989, he and his wife were killed. Romania is free. Michael begins coming back more and more. In 1992, President Bush Jr., the United States president, uh, vetoes any idea of uh, Romania restoring King Michael. Uh, Romania joins the EU and NATO. King Michael dies two years ago. There's a succession dispute between his daughter and his grandson. And there we have the Romania of today. Hmm. It's fascinating. I, was, I love doing um, the street view of Google Maps and just roaming uh, new parts of the world. And uh, I was going through these really tiny Romanian towns uh, while you're 
going through the history. You know, I noticed a motif um, that's probably prevalent throughout all of Europe, but it was beautiful, beautiful civic building, really old style, beautiful church. All the other houses are ugly and modern and plain. Well, that was a beautiful train station, too. Beautiful train stations. That was particularly true in Romania. (laughs) Yeah, I could tell. I can tell. Yeah, Trochescu did a whole lot of damage to that country. He was an evil man. Ugh. But, you know, our refusal to let Michael be restored was just one of the worst things about us. All right. Uh, who is Charles's favorite Old Testament prophet and why? Ooh. Well, that's a good question. I would say probably Isaiah. Okay, that's that's good. I, I was hoping not Jeremiah. Uh, I, I feel I feel like there's like there's a little bit of this kind of reveals your your personality and your character a little bit. Okay, so why Isaiah? Well, because he saw and he saw truly. Uh, he saw the coming of Christ, which is good. I mean. It's one reason why some people have referred to Isaiah as the fifth gospel. Hmm. And he had a wonderful line, which was so evocative of, uh, it was so evocative of um, where we are today. Uh, that I mean, it, it. I have to quote it. It's just too too perfect. There's a lot when you it, read the Bible. Sometimes you come across these gems where, where, you know, it's a line like, "Oh yeah, people are gonna worship animals and then hate babies," and lines like that where that really resonate, and you wonder how they could be that prophetic. Well, here it is, Isaiah three one five. Now, this he, he wrote attacking the Judah of his time, but I think it fits us pretty well. Quote, For behold, the sovereign Lord of hosts shall take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the valiant and the strong, the whole strength of bread and the whole strength of water, the strong man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the cunning man and the ancient, the captain over fifty, and the honorable in countenance, and the counselor, and the architect, and the skillful in eloquent speech. And I will give children to be their princes, and the effeminate shall rule over them. And the people shall rush one upon another, and every man against his neighbor. The child shall make a tumult against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. Yeah. Okay, that kind of hits the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah. The effeminate shrew them. They'll be ruled by children. What a woo woo children. They'll be ruled by boomers. Yeah. Um, Go ahead and say it. You know you want to say it. Yeah. Okay, boomer. See, I know it. But you know what? It doesn't matter because Pepperidge Farm remembers. <laughs> they have this gizmo, you see. All right. Uh, what teaching do- or in dogma of the church does Charles think that both Catholics and non-Catholics misunderstand? Thank you. That's easy. Extra ecclesia nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. They nobody wants to think about it because it sounds mean. It sounds cruel. It sounds like this, that, and the other. But before I say anything about it. I want to go to Pope Pius XII because he, in his encyclical Humani Generis, made some comments about it. And that is an important uh, important thing, I think. Uh, He came out with this August 12, 1950, Humani Generis. 
And he gives, uh, he talks about how dogma is stripped of its reality. And then he gives, uh, he uses this as. Um, is this the meaningless formula one? That's, that's right. Uh, let me see. I can find it this way. It's, it's an important one. Uh, the uh, and he, he talks, of course, about how uh, let me see. Oh, you have it already. If you if if you've got the quote, read it. That way, I won't have to use up valuable time looking for it. All right, uh, Pope Pius the twelfth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some say they are not bound by the doctrine which teaches that the mystical body of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church are one and the same thing. Some reduce to a meaningless formula the necessity of belonging to the true Church in order to gain its eternal salvation. Others finally belittle the reasonable character of the credibility of Christian faith. These and like errors, it is clear, have crept in among certain of our sons who are deceived by imprudent zeal for souls or by false science. No. Well, particularly false science, I would say. And the thing is, here's what you got to remember when you're looking at all this stuff. Revelation tells us, and actually we know naturally that there's something wrong with us. We know via Revelation it's the fall of man because of our first parents, etc. But the vast majority of people in any given era have been aware to a greater or less degree that there's something inherently wrong in the human condition. We're, we're messed up, to use a street phrase. The reason we're messed up, of course, is our first parents. Um, and the rule was that when you died as a child of Adam, you could not enjoy the beatific vision. In that sense, everyone went to hell. Um, obviously, there were different gradations. The just of the Old Testament went to what was called the bosom of Abraham. The uh, limbo of the fathers where there was no no pain except being separated from god well that um that situation required the expiation on the one hand of a god and on the other the taking up of his people into himself no one could go to the Father save through me, as he said. And the means he established for doing that were the sacraments of the church, the baptism of the Blessed Sacrament and the others. And he established the church as the means of accomplishing this. Um, this is why the church has always been likened to the Ark of Noah. It's your way out. It's your escape. Now, he never revealed any other means of salvation to us. And theologians have speculated about all kinds of possibilities that, you know, maybe somehow you can get by without uh, really getting the sacraments or doing anything else. Well, you know, if there are such exceptions, you'll find out on the other side. They're really not worth thinking about. What you should think about is keeping yourself true to the faith and the sacraments I'm trying to help everyone you know get aboard them. It's a little bit as though we were a planet doomed to destruction like dear old planet Krypton. But there was an ark to escape that ruin. Now, if that were literally the case, wouldn't you want to try to get everybody you wanted onto it? And a lot of people wouldn't believe you. They would say, what do you mean? Why, this red sun over Krypton is... Been there for millennia. 
Look at our rich Kryptonian civilization. <laughs> you really think that this thing can be ended like that? Yeah. You need to get aboard the space art. Or you need to go to Argo City and cower under the dome. But if you stay where you are, you'll be obliterated with the rest of planet Krypton. And so, coming into the church is very much like escaping an exploding planet. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to roll with that, that the Superman comic book was in the exploding of Krypton and escaping it is basically a metaphor for the necessity of baptism. Well, a lot of people have looked at it that way. <laughs> And similarly, people have looked at Superman as a Christ figure. I don't want to. I don't want to go too deeply into that. But, uh, but no. I mean, the Ark is a um, the Ark is a very good simile for the Church. Uh, one reason why the the body of a Church architecturally is called a nave that means ship. And the nave represents where the vast majority of, of the members of the church go to be safe. Hmm. So I would say that's the most misunderstood doctrine of the church. There are a lot of others. But the need of the church for salvation, the need for the, uh, for the church for salvation, for her sacraments, I mean, no, you're not going to go to heaven as long as you're a registered member of a parish. No. Uh, I forget who it was who said this, but it was very funny. I don't find the idea that only Catholics might be able to go to heaven so challenging as the idea that even Catholics can go to heaven. Wow. That's the part I find difficult. <laughs> and when you consider how woolly-headed and nasty we human beings really are, you know, uh, and again, it's always astonished me that theologians, rather than working with what we've actually got and doing our best with it, try to explain it away. Uh, and Benedict the Sixteenth spoke about this in his famous uh, Jesuit interview. Um, and he made the statement that most Catholics today are universalists. Says, whereas the missionary, the great missionaries believe this. Now he went on to say that the point of view changed because the new world was discovered and oh look at all these unbaptized souls. Surely there must be another way to look after them. But I don't think that's quite true historically. I think the idea that you don't need the faith really started more in the 18th, 19th, late 18th, the early 19th century. But having said that, when the first apostles went out, they certainly didn't believe, other than that everyone needed what they had to give. And there were far, the, when, when everything was unchurched except you and the disciples, uh, that's much more challenging, much more, uh, much more of a why, why did God make them thing than just the Americas and, and, and all that. And yet, rather than sitting around trying to figure out how the Romans and the Armenians and the Egyptians and the Georgians and all those people didn't really need the faith. They didn't worry about that. They acted believing that they did need the faith. And so they pushed through and they converted first Armenia, then Ethiopia, Georgia, and then the big prize, the Roman Empire. And that, that happened because everybody, almost, were evangelistic, even at the price of their deaths. If we adopted the same idea, think of what we could do. Think of what our clergy would be like if they thought of the sacraments that they wield as being the means of eternal life. Now, we know a lot of them don't really, certainly not the ones who matter, because of the way they dealt with COVID. You know, just do a perfect act of contrition 
and a um, spiritual communion. And hey, you're good to hook. Oh, and donate here. I could be forgiven for thinking that perhaps the donate here was the most important part on the website. Yep. Okay. Final question today. Uh, John says, what are some of the examples of great decisions made by otherwise terrible popes and terrible decisions made by otherwise great popes? Ooh. John the Twelfth confirming the charter of Cluny. He was a terrible, evil man. He was murdered by his mistress's husband, died in her arms. Very romantic. But he confirmed the charter of of, uh, Cluny Abbey, thus unwittingly opening the door for a period of reformation and reform in the church. So I would say he'd be a good example of a bad pope doing something good. Uh, The other way around, Pius XI uh, wrote some great, great stuff unwittingly sold out the Cristeros. Yeah. That was a bad one. That, that, well, I mean, that, that's a prudential decision. That's... Yeah. Yeah. That's a prudential decision. You know, he was he was wrong. Okay. Um, is that it? I feel like there's got to be got to be more in the history of the church. Oh, Sure. I mean, John the Twenty Second, who uh, denied that the just will see God. Um, hey, how's, on the one hand, how does that go? How do you, how can you say that? Well, he says that the just won't see God until the final judgment. Uh, well, that was a theory that was very proper at the time. He embraced it and then imprisoned several monks who disagreed with him. He did recant on his deathbed, though. Okay. And he was the pope to whom was given and who popularized the Sabatine privilege with the um, scapular. The scapular, yeah. The, the Wow. Cool. What? It, that was, yeah. That's a good one, right? <laughs> that's a bad pope doing a good thing. Okay. Wait, did you say John 23rd? It's uh, 22nd, 22nd. Oh, 22nd. Okay, okay. John the 22nd, okay. Uh, Paul the Sixth, who I don't think was a very good pope, gave us some money vitae. Mm. On the other hand, um, Pope Liberius, who signed the Semiarian Creed at Sirmium, uh, was also the one for whom the miracle of Our Lady of the Snow took place. Um, Pope Pius the uh, seventh. Well, Pope Pius the twelfth is a good example. Uh, he wrote *Humani uh, Humani Generis*, which you just looked at, and he wrote um, *Mediator Dei*, which did for the liturgy what he tried what the other one did for theology. And yet, he was the one who put uh, Annibale Bonini in charge of the liturgy. Ah, right. Pope Francis. Go on. No. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right, we'll leave it there. It's just there to be adored. Okay. Okay, we'll leave it there. We'll 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 keep everyone guessing what what's there. Okay. Um Okay, that's a good one. I, I like that one because it's it screws up the angel from heaven or demon from hell sort of tunnel vision that yeah. we, that we as humans all like to do, you know? We want everything simplified and it's just not. Yeah. Although things are in a bad way now, and I thought that I would read a poem from the long ago. Oh, okay, great. 
Um, this was uh, this is in reaction, ladies and gentlemen, to the news that uh, uh, in several dioceses that have retained masses set in parish churches, they're going to have to move them out to the gym, and they can't have them in the churches anymore, which is so petty. And so, oh, they're lepers. It could only come from a the fevered mind of an elderly non-binary person. I've got nothing against non-binary people. It's just that none of the apostles were non-binaries. And so probably their successors should not be non-binaries. But as you know, we have no control over that. However, way back in the 40s, the evil Father Leonard Feeney wrote a poem which really sums it up for me. It's called, <laughs> it does. It's called The Hound of Hell. Pray for the fragile daughter and the frail infant son, whom at the font, the baptismal water, I pour upon. The cycle has swung to sorrow. Our ranks have begun to fail. We know not what gate of hell tomorrow will not prevail. The foam at the mouth is frothing in the beast with the flashing tooth. The hound that was sent on the scent of nothing has found the truth. The guns will be hard to handle in the forts we will soon forsake. Pray for the light of the single candle on the birthday cake. Well, what, is of that course, last, what, is it, what does that mean, Nathan? Whose birthday cake? What, what the, uh, the bat Well, remember at the beginning. Oh, yes. the, okay. So that's like the beginning. Okay, your birthday in terms of baptism. Okay. So it says pray for the, yeah. the little ones who will be, so many of whom will be destroyed by what the, uh, what the uh, church leadership do. Okay. On that note, I um, I have a suggestion for those who find themselves. Remember, the desire is to is to isolate and push off away from the life of the church, the traditionally minded, so that all that's left are the elderly and the perverse and the weird. Now, there's a hey, problem hey, with that. Hey. What? Hey. Back off the weird, okay? No, no, I, 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 I'm among the enough. I'm a boomer. <laughs> okay. You know, Susan, the parish council, used to, you know, she used to be a friend of mine before she snuffed it. Okay. Well. We were, we were like this, you know. Okay, fair enough. We went to Blessed Sacrament together. Yeah, okay. Taught by the IHM nuns. Your faves, yeah. Yep. She listened, I didn't. That's why she became Susan from the parish council. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I actually wrote her a fan letter. I think I saw that like a year ago or something. What what you yeah. say? I said, Susan, old gal, we could really sing some serious kumbaya together. <laughs> and, you know, I think that people your age don't realize the contribution the people my age have made to church and state and continue to make anything that's stupid and nasty and wrong-minded and just only an idiot would do it addition by subtraction All you right. betcha <laughs> but you know i don't want you to look at as though we're screwing everything up well who does i want you to look at it as though we're creating a series of character building challenges for you guys to overcome. I mean, look at it this way. The current leadership will leave the church in a shambles. Think of the heroism that your generation is going to show in putting Humpty Dumpty back together again and rebuilding. I mean, you guys, you're going to be like Dom Guéranger's generation after the French Revolution. You know, we're going to be better. 
Uh, yeah. Because, uh, I mean, that, that was the prophecy by uh, St. Uh, Louis uh, Marie de Montfort, where the saints of the, the, of the later times are going to tower over, um, you know, the current ones like the cedars of Lebanon to a shrub. Oh, now we're bringing up hospitals. Fine. Yeah. See, what? Cedar Sinai? What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was the old Cedars of Lebanon Hospital merged with Mount Sinai Hospital. There you go. <laughs> and you know what uh, Cedars of Lebanon Hospital is now? What? Scientology World Headquarters in Hollywood. Nice. Brain Breathing, The Secret of the Aztecs. That will be the name of the episode. Brain breathing? <laughs> Brain breathing, the secret of the Aztecs. Well, I think I think it's good that we're getting the word out. Yeah. I think more people need to know it. You know, if I were to if I were to confront the Holy Father, I wouldn't condemn him. I wouldn't attack him. You know what I would say to him? What would you say? Your Holiness, you have taught me the truth. A brain breathing, the secret of the Aztecs. And he would look at you weird, and then that would be it. And then you take your photo where he has the unhappy face. Why do you think he would take that weird? Maybe he would understand the spirit in which I'm offering this enconium. Maybe I could say to him, you know, Your Holiness, there's really an ocean of unity. That brings together everyone of goodwill and of none and makes all of us one thing or not. And I think that really, when you come right down to it, truly, Pepperidge Farm remembers. Oh, wow. Wow. You got me on that one. And I would say that to the Holy Father. I believe it. Pepperidge Farm remembers. I think that's a message she needs. Well. So you heard it, ladies and gentlemen. Send in your Pepperidge Farm uh, labels and box tops to the Holy See. That's right. All right, that's it for this episode. Um, go oh, ahead. I, I just remembered something. Yeah. Actually, two things. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, it's Labor Day when you're seeing this. It is the beginning of autumn. And if you don't live in some godforsaken place like Southern California, it means that the weather is going to turn decent soon. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me it's not true. Come on. Come on. We are living in the Garden of Eden. That's what my dad always called it. Oh, oh, you going to go against my dad? You going to go against the family? (laughs) No, 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 no. I, I would I would never cross Don Pino. <laughs> you know, your great uncle used to say to me, you know, my own son, my own son doesn't really have it the way Don Vino has it. And I just say that's right, Don Giovanni. <laughs> and I'd smile. <laughs> and I'd look around the room. And your uncles and your father would be there smiling. And I'd keep smiling. <laughs> and it, I, I don't want to say that, that these were awkward moments or anything like that. Because, <laughs> of course, they weren't awkward at all. They were fine. I, I felt I felt fine. It was fine. Everything about it was fine. <laughs> and then your great uncle would ask me, are you, are you okay, kid? I'd say, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. And that's, that's what I would say, all right. And, you know, I, and every time I got out of there, I got out of there. You know, sometimes, because see, every now and then something would go wrong. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, well, I mean, like, for instance, let's say a delivery wasn't made. Yeah. You know, and he'd say, Carlo, he always called me Carlo, that big Italian for Charles. Yeah. Carlo, 
You know, I trusted you to have this happen. And to my utter shock and horror, it didn't. What have you got to say for yourself? And I'd say, I'm very sorry, Don Giovanni. It just, it just, it really, please save your excuses. Excuses don't pay the rent. Now go out again. Do better. I know you got it in you. You can do it. Don't disappoint me again. And then I, I slowly walk out, smiling, and I close the door behind me. And Margaret, who you may remember, used to run the phone in those days. Margaret would say to me, is everything okay? I'd say, yeah, it's fine. I'm fine. It's all fine. Oh, okay, Charles. Okay, okay. Everything's fine. That's good. I'm glad That's you a, had yes, memorable it, experiences. It, it was fine. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I just flashed on that memory. And uh, you know what Margaret would say to me then? What? Loose lips sink ships. That's right. She didn't get to where she got to with the organ, uh, uh, well, in the company. Uh, you know. Anyhow, all I'm right. Anyhow, note. yeah. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing quite like walking down that particular memory lane. All right, if it's Monday, what is it? Off the menu. What about the soul you save? Definitely your own. See you next time, everyone. God bless you all. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Kill the truck. What you doing? Move along. Move along. You see, that's a great light. Now move along. But officer, I move along now. I'll run you in. All right. What is it if it's Monday? Oh, that's well, that's a judgment. Well, what may it be if it's Monday? I don't know how to reframe that no, one. Well, what could it be if it's Monday? Ooh, ooh, what could it be if it's Monday? Okay, what could it be if it's Monday? It very well might be off the menu. Yeah. And what about the soul you save? Well, I think, conceptually speaking, there's every possibility it could be your own. See you next time, everyone. God bless. Stay non-judgmental, at least till next week. Then you can forget about it.